The DJ at the reception had the perfect track record, Shannon thought. Every song he put on was one she hated. Of course, she hadn't wanted to come to the wedding from the beginning, but since Robert's former college roommate was getting married, she had no choice. Where, she wondered, was her husband? Oh, there he is at the bar, chatting passionately with some guy she didn't know. This is worse than going to someone's high school reunion, she thought dejectedly. Hey, PK, shouted a female voice from the doorway, and Shannon looked up in surprise. Looking around, she spotted a young woman her age with a glass in her hand. Tracy, she squeaked. What are you doing here? I haven't seen you in ages. The two young women hugged. Then Tracy turned to the man who had accompanied her. Hi, Darren. This is Shannon, my best friend since high school. Shannon, this is Darren, my boyfriend. As Tracy introduced herself, Shannon eyed the young man with interest. He was just over six feet tall, his black hair slicked back. Dark stubble covered his jaw, and a silver earring was in one ear. Unlike most of the men at the reception, Darren was dressed in tight black jeans and a black leather bomber jacket worn over a black t-shirt. Tracy's found herself a bad boy, Shannon thought enviously. The pair joined Shannon at her table, and the two women began chatting animatedly while Darren ignored them and surveyed his surroundings with amused disdain. Judging by how loudly she was talking, Shannon quickly realized that Tracy had come into the bar several times before, but Shannon was just glad to see a familiar face in the crowd. When their conversation was interrupted, Darren took the opportunity. He turned to Tracy and pointed at Shannon. You said her name was Shannon. Why did you call her PK before? Tracy laughed softly. Because she's a preacher's kid, she said, and we never let her forget it. The truth was that no one, much less Shannon, could forget that her father was the minister of a Methodist church in suburban Philadelphia. His position meant she had to act like a role model. But like many other offspring of religious leaders, she rebelled in every way she could at every opportunity, much to her parents' displeasure. At school, although she was capable and a fast learner, she did poorly academically and was a constant discipline problem. By the time she was 14, she was sneaking out of the house to meet guys her parents disapproved of. It was in her middle school classes that an event occurred that changed the direction of her life. Her then-boyfriend came to pick her up for a date, but when Shannon approached his car, she found another girl in the front seat. Despite her date's fervent assurances that he was just giving the other girl a ride, Shannon became enraged with jealousy and refused to drive, secluding herself in her room to sulk. Later that night, she received a phone call informing her that her boyfriend and the other girl had died in a car accident. Even though they didn't like the boyfriend, Shannon's parents insisted she go to the funeral. As she sat in the pew during the service, she was overwhelmed with emotions. Grief over the boyfriend's death, guilt over the angry thoughts that arose that night, and most of all fear at how close she had come to taking her own life. The last emotion caused her to reevaluate her lifestyle and make significant changes. While remaining rebellious, she did begin to curb her defiance. She began to focus more on her studies at school and even took a summer job to have some income. Watching their daughter's transformation, her parents agreed that the accident, however tragic, must have been an act of divine intervention. And thanks to her innate intelligence and the work she put in during her last year and a half of high school, Shannon was able to score high enough on the entrance exam to get into the Community College of Philadelphia. She began traveling to the main campus to pursue a degree in business administration. Encouraged by the change in his daughter's behavior, Shannon's father began encouraging her to participate in singles activities that his parish offered. Although she showed little enthusiasm, her father introduced her to Robert Cunningham, a young man of about 25 who began attending the church. Robert was tall and clean-shaven, with wavy brown hair. Although he was handsome enough, Shannon was only mildly attracted to him. For a young rebellious girl attracted to bad boys, he was too respectable and conventional. But her attitude changed after she learned that this quiet young man was an agent for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Numerous movies and TV shows had filled her head with images of danger and daring, and her interest in him had increased accordingly. 
Robert, in turn, was fascinated by the attractive young woman, and the fact that she seemed to share his views and values only increased his desire. They soon became a couple, and Shannon's parents could hardly contain their joy at having their prodigal daughter back in the family. By the time Shannon graduated from community college, she and Robert were engaged. And now we're living happily ever after, Shannon told Tracy. Her friend instantly caught the sarcasm in Shannon's voice. So where is your hubby after all? She asked Shannon. You mean SpongeBob SquarePants? Shannon replied with barely concealed contempt. What did you call him? Giggled Tracy asked. SpongeBob SquarePants, Shannon repeated. I call him that because he's a total square and sucks all the fun out of my life, she said bitterly, and Tracy couldn't keep from laughing. Come on, Shannon, I thought you married something between the Lone Ranger and Elliot Ness, she teased. Her words clearly provoked Shannon. More like I married the CFO, she said angrily. No, that's not fair. An accountant would be more interesting than Robert. I don't know what he does. He never talks about his work. And when he comes home, all he wants to do is relax and hang around the house. There's no excitement or fun in my life. She was about to say something else when she noticed her husband heading in their direction. Robert was talking on his cell phone, and now he had an apologetic expression on his face. But before he could speak, Shannon introduced Tracy and her date to him. Tracy was my best friend in high school, she said, and Tracy grinned. Robert shook hands and then turned to Shannon again. Honey, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to have an early night. I'm on call tonight, and something came up at work. And Shannon wasn't too excited about the wedding reception as it was, and the thought of having to spend another evening at home watching TV only added to her bad mood. Before she could respond, however, Tracy intervened. You don't have to take her home, Robert. Darren and I can give her a ride. Let her stay with us for a while. Robert looked at Tracy uncertainly. Shannon hadn't told him much about her high school years, but his impression of Tracy wasn't entirely positive. He wondered how much the girl drank, though her boyfriend seemed sober enough. But something about him made Robert uneasy. When he hesitated, Shannon intervened. Come on, Robert. I really don't want to sit home alone on a Saturday night. When the reception is over, I'll drive back with Tracy and Darren. Okay, he said finally. But it will be quite late when I get there so don't wait up for me, darling. With those words, he kissed her and then went to pay his respects to the bride and groom. As soon as the door closed behind him, Shannon turned to Tracy with a look of gratitude on her face. Thank you, girlfriend. I would have screamed if I had to spend another night at home. Let's go get another drink. Before they could do so, Darren spoke up. You don't want to be stuck in that morgue, do you? Let's go somewhere and have some fun. Yeah. Tracy enthused, her eyes shining. Let's throw this place out and go thrill-seeking. Shannon hesitated for a moment. This wasn't exactly what she'd told Robert they'd do. But then she pushed her doubts aside. If he's going to play G-Man, there's no reason I can't go and have a good time for a change. As the three of them walked outside, Shannon was surprised to see Darren and Tracy heading toward the motorcycle. I haven't ridden one of those in a while she exclaimed. Will we all fit on it? Sure, Tracy replied enthusiastically. You sit behind Darren and I'll fit you. What about the helmets? asked Shannon. Darren laughed. Helmets are for wimps. He threw his leg over the bike and then turned to stare openly at Shannon as she pulled up her skirt and climbed onto his back. This only added to the naughtiness of her act. As soon as Tracy was nestled in the back, Darren tore out of his seat started the powerful engine, and pulled away from the bridal party. As he took a sharp turn at high speed, Shannon involuntarily squealed with fear, clutching tightly to the skinny frame in front of her. Darren turned around to bestow a knowing smirk on her, and Shannon wished again that her husband was more like him. By the time they reached the place Darren was driving them to, the combination of the vibration of the engine and the lean male body pressed so tightly against her was beginning to work on Shannon's libido. But as she hopped off the bike, she reminded herself with some regret that Darren belonged to Tracy. As the three of them entered the door below street level, Shannon realized their destination was a dance club.
The thundering music and flashing lights immediately brought her back to her teenage years, and she nearly jumped on the floor as they made their way through the semi-darkness. Tracy immediately headed towards the bar. Hey, I want to take some shots. How about you guys? Before Shannon could answer, Darren grabbed her arm and leaned over to speak in her ear. Want to try something better than booze? He asked insistently. You'll like it, I promise. Shannon pulled away and looked into his eyes. They seemed to be drilling her, and she realized she wanted to prove him right. Okay, what is it? He grinned. Let me introduce you to Molly. As Shannon looked at him in confusion, he did something quick and deft, and suddenly there was something in his palm. While she was looking at him, he took one of them, put it in his mouth, and drank it. She stared at him for another moment, then made a decision and did the same. You'll like it, Molly, he laughed, and it seemed to her as if the two of them were in cahoots. He then turned to the bar, picked up Tracy, and called out to the two of them, Come on, let's dance. The three of them squeezed into the crowd and started dancing together. At one point, Shannon leaned over to shout in Darren's ear. What about Tracy? Doesn't she like Molly? He shook his head negatively. Booze is her thing, he shouted back, and Tracy disappeared again, only to reappear shortly after with another shot in her hand. After dancing for a while, Shannon felt a sense of warmth and well-being come over her. The music seemed to match her mood, and the rhythms of the lights melded with the movements of her body, dancing to the beat. After a while, she vaguely noticed that Tracy had found a vacant chair and was beginning to pass out. Darren had gone to check on her, and Shannon felt a slight sense of loss. But he quickly reappeared, and now began to give Shannon his full attention. She wished this night would never end. A short while later, Darren picked up Tracy's breathless body and slung it over his shoulder. He then took Shannon's hand and led her to his motorcycle. He sat Tracy on the seat in front of him and threw her over the handlebars. They could have been riding for minutes or hours, but Shannon had no sense of time. All she was conscious of was a gust of wind. Finally, they stopped at an apartment building somewhere in town, and Darren carried Tracy again, and Shannon followed. Once the three of them were in the doorway of the apartment, he unceremoniously plopped the unconscious woman on the couch. That's where they did it. When she finally opened her eyes, she asked anxiously, What time is it? Almost two, he replied. She flinched. Two o'clock? God, I have to get home. The ride to her house only took 15 minutes, but it seemed to Shannon like an hour had passed. As they drove, she tried desperately to think of some plausible excuse to explain to her husband why she was so late, but she was still not thinking straight and couldn't come up with anything. When Darren pulled up in front of Shannon's house, she hastily hopped off the bike. She wanted to say something to him, but her thoughts and emotions were such a mess that she could only mumble, Thank you. I... just thank you. He grinned and quickly pulled away from the curb, waving at her. As she turned toward the house, the fear she had been suppressing within her gripped her. She did her best to quietly unlock the door, desperately hoping Robert was already asleep. If she could somehow manage to slip into bed without waking him, she thought, perhaps she could come up with some excuse in the morning. But to her surprise, when she peeked into the bedroom, Robert wasn't there. She thanked her father's God for this undeserved blessing and hurriedly stripped off her clothes, hiding them in the dark at the bottom of the laundry basket. She wanted to take a shower, but she hesitated to do so in case Robert caught her and realized how late she had left. Instead, she threw on a nightgown and got into bed, taking a deep breath of relief that she was lucky. Just how lucky she was became clear when a few minutes later she heard Robert open the door with his key. It occurred to her then, the best way to avert disaster was to take the initiative herself, with anger. So when he tiptoed into the bedroom, she reached out and turned on the bedside lamp. Where the hell have you been? She pounced on him with such fury that he involuntarily took a step back. I told you, he replied stammering. I had to leave on business. You've used that excuse too many times already, she snapped back. I'm starting to think you're seeing someone. He awed. 
No, honey, I would never do anything like that. I love you, I... But she was already on full alert and wasn't about to cede the advantage to him. If you're not seeing anyone, tell me what you've been doing, she demanded. I can't do that, honey, he pleaded. Can't or won't, she stubbornly replied. It had been a long, hard night for Robert, and his weariness and disappointment at his wife's unjust accusations overcame his restraint. It was a crime scene, he said tiredly. I had to go to the scene of the crime. Shannon was inwardly pleased that her tactic had worked, but she didn't want to let him off the hook so quickly. Crimes happen every day, Robert. What's so special about this case that you have to be stuck out on the street all night? He sighed and spoke in a low, cold voice. Do you really want to know? Okay, then. It was a murder. A double murder, in fact. Whoever did it brought them to the dump. He shook his head as if chasing away a memory. Anyway, that's what I was doing while you and your friends were having fun at the wedding reception. Are you happy now? He asked bitterly. Shannon answered nothing, but it was clear from her pale face and widened eyes what an impression his story had made. Robert quickly climbed into bed and defiantly turned his back to Shannon. She turned off the bedside lamp and pulled the covers over herself, satisfied that she had managed to divert his attention. The next morning, Shannon slept until noon. When she finally got up, Robert regarded her coolly, but as the afternoon wore on, he began to warm to her. But instead of feeling relieved that his anger had subsided, Shannon felt depressed. Saturday night had been an exciting and enjoyable adventure, but now her life was returning to the routine she had found so boring, and it was making her even more restless. Meeting Stacy and especially Darren had awakened impulses and desires in her that she hadn't felt since her school days. The resumption of a routine existence seemed almost unbearable to her. Not going to work the next morning, she was still depressed, but that was how she felt in the mornings. Her business administration degree qualified her for a position with the school district of Philadelphia, and she had managed to land a job as administrative assistant to the director of purchasing services. Shannon didn't like the director. He was a lecherous man who was always trying to look under her blouse or skirt, but she was glad she had a job. She even remembered to throw a few unintentional glances at her boss to get a good yearly grade. Still, the job mostly amounted to a boring routine, and she was quickly growing tired of it. But this Monday, she was in for a surprise. When the director went out into the lobby to greet a visitor and brought him back to the office, Shannon almost shrieked with delight. The visitor turned out to be none other than Darren. He was wearing a suit and tie, his hair was slicked back in a conservative style, and he had removed his silver earring, but there was no doubt that it was him. A slight smirk appeared on Darren's face when he noticed Shannon, but he said nothing and gave no other sign of recognition. As the two men walked into the principal's office and the door closed behind them, Shannon's mind reeled. Memories of Saturday night came flooding back to her, and she wondered about Darren's sudden appearance and his meeting with her boss. Curiosity took over and she turned on the intercom, carefully lowering the volume. The office still had the old system that allowed the director to give her instructions without leaving her desk. Shannon had long ago figured out how to use it to eavesdrop. It was risky, but she was too curious not to be tempted. After listening to their conversation for a while, she became even more perplexed. Darren seemed like nothing more than another traveling salesman trying to sell the school system cleaning and office supplies. She found it hard to believe that a Saturday night bad boy on a motorcycle could be a soap salesman. But the longer she listened, the more she thought there was something odd about their negotiations. Darren had told her boss that he represented a new business in the area, trying to build a relationship with the school system. The principal didn't seem particularly receptive at first, but then the tone of the conversation changed. Our company is very eager to show you how competitive we can be, Darren said in a confident voice. So much so that we're willing to make you a special offer. It's not uncommon for us to do business through a broker, and when we do, we pay him a 10% commission. Since we don't have a broker in this case, we're willing to offer you the same commission as a thank you for helping us get back on our feet. 
Shannon heard the director lean back in his chair and imagine the look on his face. You said 10% commission, the director said, as if he had little interest in the matter. And what would be the limit on the size of the order? No limit, Mr. Director, Darren replied calmly. The commission would remain the same and would apply to any size order. If you wanted a year's supply for the entire school district, we'd be happy to accommodate you. And how will those commissions be paid out? asked Boss Shannon a little too quickly. Our company isn't big on procedures and red tape, Darren replied lightly. I can bring you a cashier's check if that would suit you. There was a long pause, and Shannon wondered what was going on. Then she heard her boss speak again. We in the purchasing department are always interested in developing new resources for the county's needs. I think we would like to place an order with your firm for this amount. The intercom clearly picked up the sound of a piece of paper being slid across the table. Very good, sir, Darren replied. I'll have the commission check ready for you late tomorrow morning. Shannon thought she heard the two men shake hands, and she thought their negotiations were over. But then Darren spoke again, this time in a slightly different tone. Mr. Director, there is one other consideration I must inform you of. In the past, our company has experienced some unfortunate, you might say, changes of heart on the part of those to whom we have made a similar offer. We would pay a commission, and then the order would be canceled or drastically reduced. Accordingly, our company now requires simultaneous payment for the order. Furthermore, since we pay commissions by cashier's check, it is only fair that we require that the order be paid in the same manner, by cashier's check. Shannon heard the director's chair rise abruptly. That's very unusual, the principal grumbled. I don't even know if I have the authority to issue a cashier's check, especially for such a large amount. You're right, came Darren's silky voice. It is unusual, but so is the commission we're offering you. I'm sure they'll come in handy for you right now. Of course, if you find it necessary to reduce the size of the order to meet the department's standards, I understand. Another long pause followed, and Shannon found herself listening eagerly. Finally, the director spoke. No, no, I think we can handle it. But be sure to be back here before noon. I need to attend lunch tomorrow, and I don't know how late it will start. Ha! Huh, thought Shannon, who knew that the principal had no such lunch on his schedule. He wants to deposit that check ASAP. She quickly disconnected the intercom and pretended to work diligently at her computer as the two men walked out of the principal's office. Thank you again, sir. I look forward to a long and mutually beneficial relationship between our organizations, Darren purred. He then turned and left without even looking at Shannon. As she drove home from work that afternoon, Shannon couldn't stop thinking about what she had overheard. She may not be a lawyer or a police officer, but when she heard the offer of a bribe, she immediately knew it was a bribe. It didn't particularly surprise her that Darren might have offered a bribe to get county business, but she still couldn't picture him as a sales rep, even a fraudulent one. And then there was the whole cashier's check thing. Having gotten the principal to agree to the deal, why would Darren risk it all by throwing him such a surprise? We'd have to think about that question some more. Her thoughts turned to the director, and she shook her head in disgust. The fact that the old lecher was willing to accept a bribe did not surprise her either, and for a moment, she wondered if she ought to tell someone what had happened. But that thought quickly passed. It wasn't her problem. But her thoughts kept returning to Darren. She hadn't expected to see him again. His appearance at her workplace had triggered a flurry of emotions she could barely control. That night, she dreamed about him. The next morning, when Darren arrived at the building, the principal rushed to escort him into his office like a celebrity. No interruptions, Shannon, he barked at her, and Shannon had to struggle to hold back a grimace. As soon as the two men disappeared behind the closed door, she quickly turned on the intercom. When the director asked if he had a commission, Darren's voice sounded like he'd been dipped in butter. Yes, he replied. And to show you how much confidence my company has in you and the school district, let me show you our cashier's check before I even see your order and payment. Shannon imagined the scene of the principal snatching the check and anxiously scanning it. After a pause, she heard him say to Darren, Everything seems to be in order. 
Very well. Here is our check and our order for the amount we discussed yesterday. It took me a bit of work to get a cashier's check for that amount, but here it is. Thank you, sir, Darren replied. You won't regret it. And let me remind you that our arrangement will continue for all future orders. You'll see. It will be a very favorable arrangement for all of us. Very well, said the director. And now, if you'll excuse me, I must go to that lunch I mentioned. And th they returned to the hallway and the principal told Shannon he was heading to lunch. She nodded and said she would take her lunch break as well. As soon as the men left, Shannon grabbed her coat and hurried to her car. As she made her way through the lunch traffic, she thought about what she had gotten herself into. Nevertheless, she kept going and soon found herself outside the shabby apartments she remembered from Saturday night. She got into her car and waited, hoping she had interpreted the situation correctly. It wasn't long before she saw Darren pull up and head for the front door. She quickly jumped out of the car and ran towards him. Darren, wait! He turned around, and there was a look of surprise on his face for a moment, and then it turned into a wary look. Hey, Shannon, you can come inside, he said, and held the door for her. There was no one else in the apartment, and once inside, he turned and looked at her, crossing his arms. What are you doing here? he demanded. Shannon ignored his question. I was listening to you, she told him. I heard everything you talked to the principal about. I know you bribed him. So, he asked in a sullen tone, are you going to turn me in? She ignored him again. Only I don't think there's more to it than bribery. I don't believe you're a soap salesman. I think you're a crook. I think that check you gave him is worthless. Darren's mouth twisted in a crooked grin, but his eyes didn't smile. You're smarter than I thought. Yes, the whole deal was a scam, and the check I gave him was as phony as the politician's promises, he said. But the check he gave me from the school district was worth its weight in gold, and I've already cashed it. What happens if the principal tries to cash the check and discovers it's counterfeit? She asked. Won't he sick the police on you? His smirk was even more brazen now. That's the beauty of this particular case. He's finished, no matter what he does. The only way he can denounce me is if he admits he took a bribe. He probably won't want to do that until he's forced to explain why there was no supply of cleaning supplies. I'll be long gone by then. Then Darren's eyes narrowed. So how much do you want for your silence? I don't want your money, she replied flatly. This time he was visibly surprised. No? Then what do you want? She looked at him intently. I want you to take me with you. Her answer caught him off guard, and he thought for a moment. Then his face relaxed, and the smile returned. Are you sure? You really want to leave your loving husband, your nice house in the suburbs, and your nine-to-five job? He asked mockingly. Do you really want to give all that up to run away with me? A beastly expression appeared on her face. I think I've been looking for a man like you all my life. I'm leaving town right now. I'll be outside your house in an hour. If you're not ready to go, I won't wait for you. We're leaving on your motorcycle? She asked. No, I'll be in the car. Sometimes you have to leave your toys behind when you live this kind of life. What about Stacy? She asked. Like I said, you have to be ready to leave your toys behind. Now go and be at your house at 1.30 or I'll leave you behind too. Shannon kissed him again, then ran for the door. Jumping into her car, she quickly drove to the nearest branch of their bank and withdrew money from her checking and joint savings accounts. She then rushed home. There she grabbed her suitcase and makeup bag and hastily stuffed them with a few things she felt she couldn't live without. Going downstairs, she grabbed a piece of paper to write Robert a note, but couldn't think of what to say. Finally, she wrote, I'm sorry, and left the note on the kitchen table along with her wedding ring. She then headed out to the porch to keep an eye on Darren. As she sat on the steps, doubt stirred in her. This was the craziest, most impulsive act of her life, and her conscience was screaming at her to stop before it was too late. But just at that minute, she saw an unremarkable sedan pull up in front of her house, and she ran toward it with bated breath, leaving the door to their apartment unlocked. She stuffed her bags into the trunk and then slid into the passenger seat as Darren pulled away from the curb. As they drove, 
Shannon's thoughts turned to Robert, and for a moment she felt sorry for him. She knew that he really loved her, and this would hurt him deeply. Then she thought of her parents and how disappointed they would be when they found out what she had done. But it doesn't matter, she thought furiously. This is my life, and they can't try to control it anymore. I know what I want and what I need, and I'm going to get it. The next few months passed like a blur for Shannon. Darren went south to Wilmington, and the two of them settled into a cheap motel with long-term rates and a short memory. The days and nights were a blurry combination of vacation and honeymoon. Nothing was planned. Everything was done on impulse. Shannon liked the lack of responsibility, the ability to sleep until noon after all-night parties, and the fact that she didn't have to answer to anyone else. Once in a while she thought of them, as well as Robert, but angrily shoved those thoughts away. That was then. This is now, she told herself. I live my life on my own terms. I do what I want. So Darren was a little shocked when he woke her from her sleep one afternoon and told her she'd have to go out to work. We don't have much money, he explained. We need to make some money. By this time, Shannon was awake, though still somewhat confused. What do you want me to do? She asked irritably. He ignored her question. You're going to be a legal secretary, he informed her. And, but I don't know anything about legal work, she protested. You also don't know anything about pigeon work, he replied calmly. But you will. But first we need to go shopping. After lunch, they went to the Nordstrom store in the Christiana Shopping Center, southwest of downtown Wilmington. Walking through the women's department, Shannon noticed Darren strolling a few aisles away from her with the corner of her eye. As she continued shopping, she soon found a black Alexander Wong pencil skirt with a zipper slit on the side. She immediately knew it was perfect and asked the saleswoman if she could try it on for size. The fit was perfect. Exiting the fitting room, she hung the skirt back on the rack, leaving it sticking out a bit among the others. Then she told the girl she wanted to go shopping again and moved on to the blouses. Going through the display cases, Shannon soon settled on a white, long-sleeve model that looked appropriate for the office. Remembering Darren's instructions, she tried one on a size smaller than she normally wore. After admiring herself in the fitting room mirror, she returned the blouse to the rack, again leaving it slightly protruding. From there, she headed to the shoe department, and after trying on several styles, selected a pair of elegant black high-heeled shoes, which she bought with cash, despite the $300 price tag. She then proceeded casually to the food court and sat down in a chair. A few minutes later, Darren joined her, carrying a large bag from Chump Sports. Did you buy everything? She asked worriedly, and when he nodded, she asked, Maybe we should get out of here. No, he replied dismissively. It's all clear. What makes you so sure? She asked. It's simple, he said. The stores aren't looking for men who steal women's clothes. Someone may have been watching you walk around the store, but they don't usually pay attention to men roaming the women's department. Then why did I have to buy those expensive shoes? She asked, still feeling uneasy. For three reasons, he said. First, shoe salesmen keep a close eye on their merchandise, so shoes are hard to deceive. Second, such expensive shoes usually have identification chips that need to be disabled before leaving the store. Lastly, if someone does suspect you, they will forget about you as soon as you make the purchase. A thief would never buy anything, especially such an expensive item. Despite his assurances, Shannon was relieved when they finally arrived back at the motel. Darren turned on the weather channel and watched for several minutes. Finally, he turned off the television. Looks like tomorrow will be a good day for dove hunting, he said. That's what we'll do. Shannon wasn't thrilled to be a part of Darren's con. In her mind, it was one thing to be in league with him, quite another to become an active participant. Nevertheless, she saw no way to avoid it, so at noon the next day, she nervously headed down Delaware Avenue toward DuPont Park. She was wearing the clothes Darren had stolen from the store the day before, and she hoped she looked like the secretary she was supposed to be. She had already spotted Darren on the opposite side of the street and half a block ahead of her. When she reached the small park, 
He made a discreet gesture with his hand, and she looked to her right to see a man sitting on a bench by the fountain. She glanced back at Darren to make sure she wasn't mistaken, and, seeing him nod, approached the stranger from behind. He looked to be about sixty years old and had gray, thinning hair. He was wearing a suit and tie, and as she came closer, it was clear that the suit was an old style, as evidenced by the worn cuffs and collar. She took a deep breath. It was time for introductions. Sir, I'm sorry, sir. I think you dropped this, she said, holding out a large unmarked business envelope to him. The man turned to look at her, and Shannon noticed that even as he was looking at the envelope she was holding, he took the opportunity to look at her one more time before responding. Darren knew what he was doing when he made me dress like that, she thought approvingly. No, I'm sorry, young lady. It doesn't belong to me, the old man said with a smile. Are you sure? asked Shannon. I noticed it under the bench just where you're sitting. He shook his head again. No, it's not mine, but thanks for asking. Shannon sank down on the bench next to him and watched as his gaze traveled to the slit in her skirt. What do we do with this envelope? she asked. It feels heavy. She handed it to him, and he weighed it in his hands. Then he handed it back to her. Maybe there's an address or something inside that will tell us who this belongs to, she said, trying to look the older man in the eye. Good idea, he said, clearly relishing the opportunity to spend time with the pretty young woman. When she unzipped the envelope and pulled it out, she sighed dramatically. Oh my gosh, there's money in there. She shoved the envelope back into his hands and saw his eyes widen as he realized what she had seen. How much money is in there? She asked excitedly, and he pulled the wads of bills into his lap. Now it was his turn to gasp. These are wads of hundred-dollar bills, he said in a quiet voice. He began counting them quickly, and when he finished, he turned to her and said, There are twenty bundles here, and there are twenty-five bills in each. That means there's fifty thousand dollars dollars in here. She looked at him with widened eyes. Can we keep them? After all, there's no first or last name on the envelope, and there's nothing inside to indicate who they belong to. That would be $25,000 for each of us. She saw the eagerness in his eyes, but he still hadn't fully calmed down. I think we should report it to the authorities in case someone lost it, he said. But when she looked at him disappointed, he quickly added, But maybe if no one claims it, we can keep it. Shannon tilted her head as an idea hit her. My boss is a lawyer. He works in the building across the street. Let me give him a call. He'll know what to do. Before her conversation partner could respond, she pulled out her cell phone and defiantly called her boss. After a minute's conversation, she hung up and turned to the man again. He said he was on his way to a meeting, but he'll stop by on the way. Oh, look, there he goes. She pointed to the figure of Darren, who was dressed in a dark blue suit, white shirt and striped tie, and was holding a heavy legal briefcase. After introductions, Shannon explained the situation to him. Darren took the envelope and took a quick look at the contents. Looking at Shannon and the older man, Darren nodded sagely. I know exactly what this is, he said. I've seen it before. It's drug money. Someone was going to pay it off, but something went wrong. So what do we do now? asked Shannon. Of course we have to report it to the police. But I'm happy to tell you that after a few formalities are completed, the money belongs to the finder. Shannon squealed and hugged her co-player in delight. He happily responded to her hug. Before you get too excited, Darren interjected, there is one small complication. Those sitting on the bench looked worriedly at each other, then at the lawyer. The problem is, he continued, the unmarked envelope is one of the tricks used for money laundering. They claim to have found it. Then when it goes unclaimed and they take possession of it, they have clean money. But we're not drug dealers, the older man objected. I know that, Darren replied, but you need to convince the police of that, not me. He paused for a moment to let the frustration have time to take over, then spoke again. I think I know a way. If each of you put a little of your money down, it will show the police your integrity. Besides, no drug dealer would ever put his money in that way. Shannon saw the doubt on the older man's face, so she spoke quickly. 
That makes sense to me. How much should we contribute to show good faith? It would be ideal if each of you contributed half of the total amount. That would clearly show the police that you are honest and not trying to pull some money laundering scheme. Shannon spoke quickly again. I have a little over $25,000 in a savings account at the bank across the street. If it means an opportunity to double it, I'm willing to do it, especially since we're going to turn it over to the police. She turned to her companion. How about you? Can you do the same? When he hesitated, she hastened to continue. My husband and I could really use $25,000 dollars. I'll bet you could use that amount too. Yes, we could use it, the older man agreed, and then seemed to make up his mind. My bank is just around the corner. I can withdraw $25,000 from my retirement account. Great, Darren quickly muttered. Now here's what you need to do. Each of you should withdraw the money while I contact the police. Remember to ask your bank to put the money in an envelope along with the withdrawal slip and seal it. That way there'll be no questions about where the money came from. And then get back here as soon as you can. Shannon grabbed her new friend's hand and pulled him excitedly from the bench. Let's go, she said excitedly. Let's go. He gladly took her hand and they walked away from the park. After they crossed the street, he let her go with some reluctance to head to his bank. Nay, Shannon was already waiting with the envelope when the gray-haired man returned, puffing with haste. Darren took the large envelope they had found and opened it so they could both see the $50,000 lying inside. Then he put the envelopes from Shannon and the old man in there, closed the flap, licked it open and sealed it. There, he said triumphantly. That way the police will know it hasn't been tampered with. Then he checked his watch defiantly. And where are those detectives? He pulled out his cell phone, turned away, made a call, and started talking. Even hearing only one side of the conversation, it was obvious to Shannon and her new friend that something was wrong. Darren turned to the two of them again, holding his finger over the speaker. There's been an accident and they've been delayed, he informed them. It'll be about 15 minutes before they can get here. He looked around and then back to the two of them. Look. I'm not comfortable keeping this much money in plain sight. We need to put it somewhere safer. He turned to the older man. Is your car parked nearby? The gray-haired man nodded quickly. Yeah, I'm parked on the first level of the parking lot over there, he said. Good, Darren said approvingly. We'll go there and lock the envelope in the trunk of your car. I'll let the police know where to find you. With those words, he turned around, said a few more sentences, and hung up. The three of them then crossed the street and entered the garage, with the older man walking in front. That's my car over there, he told them, pointing to a Chevrolet in the middle of one row. As the three of them approached the car, there was a clang of metal against concrete, and Shannon let out a slight squeal. Oops, I dropped my phone. She cautiously bent down and began fumbling around on the ground before retrieving it. When she stood up, she saw an older man staring at her intently. She held out the phone to him. Do you think it will be okay? He took the phone from her to examine it, and Shannon watched over his shoulder as Darren exchanged the envelope of money for the exact same one he had taken out of his briefcase. When Shannon and her friend turned back to Darren, he held out the envelope and asked the old man to open the trunk. When he did, Darren defiantly put the envelope inside and slammed the lid loudly, asking the man to lock the car again. I feel better now he said encouragingly. Then he checked his watch again. Sorry, but if I don't hurry up, I'm going to be late for my meeting. The police should be here any minute, so you two just wait for them here by the car. Before they could say anything else, he hurried away. The old man looked around restlessly, and Shannon quickly grabbed her arm. So tell me, she asked with a reassuring expression on her face, what are you going to do with all that money? Soon the man was talking about European vacations and other dreams, and Shannon nodded and smiled in agreement. When he paused to catch his breath, a look of discomfort appeared on Shannon's face. Damn it, I really need to use the restroom. I'm going to run to the ladies' room at the bank and then I'll be right back. She leaned over and kissed his cheek. Don't go, she said with a smile, and hurried toward the door to the lobby. 
Instead of stopping, she hurried straight through the lobby. Once out of the building, she turned west and walked down the street until she was in an alley. Darren was parked there with the engine idling. When he pulled away, she was nearly shaking from the adrenaline rush. How did I do? She asked in excitement. Like a pro, baby, like a pro, Darren replied. That's how you do a pigeon drop. I wonder how long it will be before he opens the trunk and finds an envelope full of newspapers, she asked. Long after we leave here, Darren replied. She laughed gleefully and leaned back in her seat as they drove toward the motel. As they pulled up to the motel, Darren turned and looked at Shannon. Go inside and wait for me. I need to stop by the bank right away. What bank? She asked in confusion. The Bank of Moscow, he replied calmly. The Bank of Moscow? She asked in surprise. I've never heard of it. Why should you go there? It is better for you not to know, he replied curtly. Noticing her gloom, he hastened to continue. When I get back, we're going out to have fun. While she waited for Darren, Shannon began to reflect on what they had just done. Now that the euphoria of a successful con was gone, she couldn't help but think about the old man they had just robbed. Guilt stirred in her at the memory of his shabby clothes, but she angrily pushed it out of her thoughts. He's probably got tons of money in the bank, she told herself. He won't miss it. Still, she was beginning to feel a little depressed. She wanted to live with the bad boy, but she never thought she'd have to be involved in his affairs. My dad would just die if he found out, she thought, and so would Robert. The thought made her angry with herself. Why should I even care what they think? She asked herself in disgust. To throw herself off balance, she pulled a joint out of Darren's bag and lit up. By the time Darren returned, she was high, giggling, and hungry. Darren was amused by this. Come on, baby, he told her. Let's go eat, and then we'll play a little. A week later, Darren informed Shannon that it was time for them to move on. We're leaving as soon as I get back, he told her. When she asked where he was going, he said to a business meeting. After Darren returned, the two of them quickly loaded their belongings into an unremarkable car. Darren stopped by the motel office, paid their bill, and then got behind the wheel and drove north on I-95. Are we going back to Philadelphia? asked Shannon. No, he replied curtly. To Newark. Why Newark? asked Shannon curiously. Because we have great business opportunities there, replied Darren. What kind of opportunities? asked Shannon, and Darren let out an audible sigh. Okay, he said. We have a lot of time ahead of us, so I think now is a good time to talk about it. Do you remember the scam I pulled in Philadelphia with the school board? he asked, glancing at Shannon. Of course, she replied. It's a similar situation in Newark, only on a much larger scale. If we play our cards right, we can pull off a very big score that will put us out of business for a long time. Why can't we do it in Wilmington? Shannon asked, puzzled. What's so special about Newark? Darren rolled his eyes and started lecturing her like a child. Newark has the largest education system in New Jersey, but it has one of the worst graduation rates in the state. The school system got so bad that the state government took control of it in 1995 and has been running it ever since. The system is also underfunded and mired in corruption. That doesn't sound very promising to me, Shannon said. You might think so, but there's the other side of the coin. The problems are so well known that the system has gotten a lot of money from warm-hearted do-gooders trying to help. The guy who founded Facebook donated $100 million, and other rich people have contributed as well. Everyone is looking for ways to get the system up and running. And that's where we come in. It was clear from the look on Shannon's face that she still didn't understand what Darren was talking about. The last quick solution they want to try is to hand out computers to the students to help them with their schoolwork, Darren continued. Shannon burst out laughing. Yeah, like that's going to help. They'll just spend all their time on Facebook or playing games. Maybe so, Darren replied. But who cares? The main thing is that this is a big opportunity for us. We'll come in and offer to sell them a whole shipping container full of iPads at a discounted price, and they'll jump at the offer. 
Where are we going to find a container full of iPads? asked Shannon incredulously. Our friends at the Bank of Moscow already have one, replied Darren. Okay, now you have to tell me, demanded Shannon. What is the Bank of Moscow? It's not really a bank, Darren said. I just call it that because they're willing to finance scams and other types of crime. They're actually part of the Russian Mafia. Why would the Russian Mafia fund other people's deals? Why don't they just pull their own deals? It's simple, Darren said. They can make a lot of money without risking anything. And what happens if the scam goes bust or their borrowers get arrested? Seems to me that would be a big risk. They're not like a normal bank, Darren explained. If you borrow money from them, you pay it back with interest no matter what. If you end up in jail, your family has to pay. There's no getting away from borrowing from these guys. Shannon wasn't convinced. What if the family can't or won't pay? Darren shuddered. Trust me, you don't want to know what would happen then. Let's just say the BOE doesn't have a bad debt problem. They always collect the money. So where did these Russian guys get the iPad container? queried Shannon. Darren rolled his eyes at her like she was a simpleton. Of course they stole it, he told her. And they're just going to give it to us? she asked, still not understanding. No, Darren said slowly, as if addressing a child. They're not going to give it to us. They're going to lend it to us along with the money we'll need as startup capital. In return, they'll get half the proceeds from our little scam. Half, exploded Shannon. We take all the risk and they get half? Sounds like a lot, I know, but think about it. Where else do we stand a chance of getting $2 million in one deal? $2 million? You're kidding, right? Do the math yourself, Darren said. There are 10,000 iPads in this container, and they're fancy thin devices with 128 gigs of memory. These babies retail for $800 apiece. We sell them to the school system for half price, which makes them look like damn heroes, and we get $4 million. We split it with the Bank of Russia and walk away with a cool two stone. With that kind of money, we can go anywhere and do anything. He took his eyes off the road to see how she was taking all this and saw that she still had a skeptical expression on her face. You really think you can trick the school board or anyone else into buying stolen goods? She asked. He grinned. Our new partners told me that the guy we're going to have to deal with is Gordon Sesterman, head of the Newark Today's Future Foundation. This guy is buckling in two ways. He's politically ambitious, and he's not too picky about where possible campaign funds come from. So they think he can be touched. But in any case, I'm not going to cheat this guy. I don't understand, she asked incredulously. How are we going to do that? He paused and smiled even wider. I'm not going to trick him. You're going to do it. Me? She gasped, astonished. I don't know how to do something like that. Don't worry, baby. I'll accompany you every step of the way. In your hands, it will be just butter. The day after they checked into an inexpensive motel near Newark Airport, Darren and Shannon traveled to Manhattan for another shopping trip. They returned with a full closet for her, including lingerie from Agent Provocateur, a dark gray Armani women's suit from Saks Fifth Avenue, and a pair of black suede high-heeled Burberry boots. As before, her only purchase was the boots, for which she paid cash. The two of them spent the rest of the evening discussing what Shannon should do and how she should respond to questions and concerns Gordon Sesterman might have. Darren had already contacted Sesterman's office at Fonda to set up a meeting and introduce Miss April Johnson, Vice President of Sales for Global Resources, as the person to call. All brands are the same, Darren assured her. If you can get them to focus on the reward, they'll convince themselves that everything else you say is true. Once they start imagining the prize, they'll want to believe you. Shannon had spent a restless night. Not only was she nervous about the role she was about to play, but she was especially worried about her increasing involvement in Darren's schemes. Yet once again, she saw no way to turn from her chosen path. The next morning, she was so nauseous, she couldn't eat anything before the meeting. But after putting on a tracksuit and boots, she felt a little better. 
Before she got into the cab that was to take her to the foundation office, Darren told her. Remember, baby, you have a secret weapon. You're beautiful. It's hard for a man to say no to someone like you. Shannon hoped he was right. Settling into Sesterman's office, she quickly talked about what she'd rehearsed with Darren. Global Resources, she told him, had purchased a container of 10,000 iPads at throwaway prices. They were $800 luxury models, but her firm could offer them to the foundation for half price if it could take the whole lot. It was an absurd story, and Shannon was sure that Sesterman would quickly throw her out of his office. But as she recounted her proposal, it soon became clear that Sesterman was paying more attention to her body than to her words. To make sure she was right, she crossed and uncrossed her legs several times, and each time he scrutinized the movement like a child examining toys through a store window. I can use this, she thought, and her confidence began to grow. She quickly turned her attention away from the details of the deal and began to praise the work the foundation was doing and the importance of the role that Sesterman was playing. Seeing his positive reaction, she began to describe what a coup it would be to purchase so many tablet computers for the school system. She went on to speculate about the favorable publicity such an accomplishment would generate and the political implications of the success. The people of Newark are looking for a leader who has the vision for the city's problems and the determination to see this through, she said. For the right person, this could be a real game changer. I My company would be interested in supporting such a leader, she continued. We are willing to contribute seed money to help launch a political campaign. We're talking about 1% of sales as a kind of commission. That would be very helpful in launching a campaign for mayor. She watched him do the math. Yes, he said slowly. $40,000 would be very handy. She deliberately interrupted him, just as Darren had intended. No, Mr. Sesterman, not 1% of our price to you, but 1% of the retail value. His eyes widened. $80,000? Exactly, she said, smiling slightly. He seemed to be staring off into the distance. Then his eyes focused on her face and narrowed. You've given me much food for thought, Miss Johnson, he said slowly. I wish I had a little more time to think about your proposal before coming to a final decision. Shannon's smile widened. Of course, Mr. Sesterman but you must realize that we have other potential opportunities to move this merchandise. Rapid inventory turnover is the key to success for us. Sesterman looked at her shrewdly and nodded. I understand all that. Why don't we meet at the same time tomorrow to continue our discussions? Shannon smiled, rose gracefully, and extended her hand to shake. I'll look forward to it, she replied calmly. Then she turned and walked out of his office. When she returned to Darren, she was burning with excitement to tell him everything that had happened. Oh my God, Darren, I think this could work. He hardly asked any questions, and when I started talking about what this could do for him. You know what this means, babe? If we can pull this off, we'll walk out of here with two million bucks. We can go anywhere and do anything. At the when Shannon returned for a follow-up meeting the next day, she was wearing another store-stolen outfit that was appropriate for business. She walked into Sesterman's office with confidence, and his opening response only reinforced her attitude. Miss Johnson, I have carefully reviewed your company's proposal and find it extremely interesting. He's hooked, she thought, trying not to betray the triumph on her face. However, in the course of my research, I came across an interesting situation that I would like to share with you, Sesterman continued. About nine months ago, a school system in Philadelphia contracted to purchase a large quantity of cleaning supplies from a new vendor. After the supplies were never delivered, an investigation was conducted. In the end, the head of the purchasing department admitted that he had received a bribe from a bogus supplier. At those words, Shannon's excitement turned to fear. Oh my God, she thought. He knows about us. The police must be outside by now, ready to arrest me. Her heartbeat quickened and sweat broke out under her armpits. It was all she could do not to rush to the door. But what I really found interesting about this story, Sesterman continued, is that the bribe the purchasing director received was in the form of a cashier's check. 
Ironically, that cashier's check was just as phony as the supply contract itself. Shannon wondered if she should faint. Sesterman smiled smugly at her. The philosopher George Santayana famously said that those who don't learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. So, in order not to risk repeating that unpleasant lesson, I will accept your offer, but with three conditions. If you cannot fulfill all three, then we have nothing further to discuss. Shannon was stunned, unable to comprehend what was happening. He's not going to arrest me? Is he really going to take the deal? She asked herself in confusion. Disregarding his visitor's inner confusion, Sesterman continued. Here are my terms. First, the campaign contribution your company is so generously willing to make must be in cash and must be delivered at the same time as the product is delivered. Shannon had already recovered somewhat from her panic, but Sesterman's condition was alarming. How are we going to get $80,000 in cash? She asked herself. But she kept an impassive expression on her face, and Sesterman continued. The second condition is that I must see the merchandise myself. I'm not buying anything until I've seen all 10,000 of these iPads. When Shannon fell silent, Sesterman smiled and cleared his throat. My third condition is of a different, more personal nature. Before we finalize our deal, you will be required to spend the night with me at the Meadowlands Hilton Hotel. Shannon gasped and jumped up from her chair, looking at Sesterman in shock. But before she could tell him where to shove his terms, she caught herself and slowly sat back down. Trying to pull herself together, she told him, I didn't expect anything like this from you, Mr. Sesterman. I am appalled at what you are demanding. I think it would be best to discuss it with my colleagues. Good day, sir. With these words, she stood up again and headed for the door. Sesterman's parting words made her stop. Please don't hesitate long, Miss Johnson. My offer is not to be delayed. Quick turnover of inventory, you understand. Me Shannon gritted her teeth in fury but said nothing more. When she returned to the motel, her angry look told Darren that things had gone wrong. Before she could speak, he demanded, What happened? What went wrong? When she told him about Sesterman demanding cash from him, Darren didn't see it as an insoluble problem. I didn't expect that, but I think we can do without it. Let me talk to the Russians and see what they say. Similarly, Sesterman's demand to show the goods did not bother Darren. The Russians have received the container at the port of Newark. I'll arrange a special introduction for Sesterman when I call them about the dollar eighty. It might work for us, Shannon. It'll be fine. Shannon was getting angrier by the second. No, it won't, she yelled, because I'm not going to sleep with that bastard. That's his third condition, exclaimed Darren. He wants to entertain you? That's great. That means he's in on it. We got him, baby. We got him. Shannon was stunned by his answer. I'm not a prostitute, she protested. I don't want to spend the night with that prude. Darren grabbed her shoulders so tightly that Shannon flinched. Grow up, Shannon, he shouted at her. It's time you realized that you're using every trick you have in this game. You're already using it to sell. Now use some more to close the deal. But what about you and me? asked Shannon, almost crying. How will you treat me if I entertain him? And I Darren put his arm around her shoulders and pulled her against him. Then he lifted her chin to look into her eyes. Baby, I'll love you even more if you pull this off. It's like winning the World Series. It's epic. One night with the tag means nothing to me. Shannon looked up at him, wanting to believe that everything was okay, but she still wasn't happy. She hadn't wanted to be a part of the con from the beginning, and now she felt like Darren was using her. And what she saw in his eyes didn't make her feel any better. Still, she wanted to make him proud of her, and she had to admit she wanted the rewards this job could bring them. After a few minutes, she reluctantly told Darren that she would do as he wished. With the crisis averted, Darren wanted to get back to the other terms of Sesterman, and he had a plan matured. Now that we know we have him in our hands, I think we can use the cash as leverage against him. With Darren's guidance, Shannon called Sesterman and informed him that the deal was acceptable and arranged to meet him at the hotel two nights later. Sesterman was clearly enthusiastic, but Miss Johnson quickly brought him back down to earth. We have a condition of our own. 
If you want our campaign contribution in cash, you'll have to pay for the computers in cash as well. Sesterman started to rant, but Shannon interrupted him. Justice is justice, Sesterman. Just as you guarantee that you won't be cheated out of a fake cashier's check, we have to guarantee that we won't be cheated out of a fake order. That way, everyone will be on an equal footing and there will be no misunderstandings. Sesterman was outraged. How the hell do you expect me to get my hands on $2 million in cash? And even if I could, the largest bill in circulation is $100. Do you have any idea how much that amount of cash would weigh? Shannon turned off the sound and looked at Darren with a concerned expression. But Darren told her, Hang in there. She muted the sound on the phone and said, If you can't take the cash, offer us another option. Otherwise, the deal is off. Sesterman continued to blaze, but calmed down after a few minutes. What about eurobonds? He asked suddenly. They are the same as cash. There is a considerable amount of eurobonds in the fund. I could use them for this purchase. Would that work? When Shannon looked at Darren, he shrugged uncertainly, then quickly wrote on a piece of paper and held it out to her. Let me consult with our financial experts, Mr. Sesterman, Shannon said. I should be able to get back to you within the hour. When Shannon hung up, Darren quickly called his Russian interlocutor and began to explain what had happened. Then he listened for a long time before hanging up. What did they say? asked Shannon anxiously. The Russians told me that euro bonds are issued by corporations and governments in Europe. They're like bearer bonds. Whoever owns the certificates can redeem them for cash at any time. The Russians said they often use them to launder money. If the bonds are legal, they'll accept them. And what does that mean? asked Shannon uncertainly. Darren began circling her around the room. It means we got him, he shouted. He really wants this deal. I bet he's already started writing his campaign ad. When they had calmed down, Shannon called Sesterman back and confirmed that the Eurobond payment would be acceptable. The deal was done. After the initial excitement passed, Shannon's emotions began to fluctuate up and down. Darren was constantly praising her, telling her that the con couldn't succeed without her, and she loved feeling that she was so important to him. At other times, however, she felt like she was just a pawn being used in Darren's game, and she wondered how Darren really felt about her. What angered her the most was the thought that he might force her into prostitution. And the fact that Darren was willing to put her in that role angered her even more. Despite her misgivings, two days later, Shannon found herself in the lobby of the Meadowlands Hilton Hotel. She had purposely arrived early and was seated at the far end of the lobby. Over dinner, accompanied by several bottles of wine, Sesterman spoke at length about the work of the Foundation. His boastful tales suggested that the Foundation's accomplishments were directly attributable to its leadership. Shannon tried to appear enthusiastic, but her thoughts wandered. As she listened to Sesterman, she caught a glimpse of a man who looked a lot like her father. The resemblance brought back memories of her father lecturing her. You can't do that, Shannon. Good girls don't act like that. You don't want people talking about you. I'll do what I want to do, she thought, and no one will be able to tell me otherwise. All her earlier reluctance evaporated. Impulsively, she leaned across the table and interrupted Sesterman's monologue. That's very interesting, but don't you want to take the bottle of wine upstairs and continue the conversation in your room? In the room, she continued to command. Closing the door, she grabbed the bottle of wine and took several large sips straight from it. After that, they got down to it and fell asleep. A few hours later, she woke up confused, not realizing where she was. But the view out the window of the lights of Manhattan quickly brought back to her everything that had happened that evening. As she came to her senses, a sense of elation swept over her. She reveled in the thought that she had fooled this marker, who was soon to give them $2 million in cash. Now let's talk business. He spoke. Here's how it's going to go. You will meet me at my office tonight at 5 o'clock. Bring with you $80,000 in a briefcase. Come alone, no one else, or the deal is canceled. The euro bonds will be waiting for me. I'll count the cash, and you count the bonds to make sure everything is in order. 
Then, when we are both satisfied, you and I will go to the vault I have rented. You'll take a heavy-duty padlock with you, and so will I. We'll both lock up the money so no one can do any tricks. We'll leave the money in the locker while we inspect the goods at the container terminal. Once I can verify that you actually have the iPads, you and I will go back to the locker and each of us will pick up our money. He paused. Understood? He asked. When she nodded, he looked at her for another moment. Remember, no tricks, he said. Shannon held his gaze, hoping the disgust she felt for him wasn't apparent. No tricks, Sesterman. All that will happen is that everyone will get exactly what they want. Sesterman gave her a thin smile and headed for the door. When she returned to the motel, Darren was waiting impatiently for her and wouldn't leave her alone until she told her what had happened. When she described the scenario that Sesterman had outlined for the day's deal, Darren made a thoughtful expression on his face. It's going to take some work, he said, but I think we can make it work. I'm going to go talk to the Russians and make some plans. With those words, he left Shannon to pack their meager belongings in the expectation of a quick escape as soon as they pulled off the scam. Stuffing her suitcases, she felt overwhelmed again. The rebelliousness of the night before was gone, replaced by insecurity. The way Sesterman had treated her that morning had revealed the true nature of what she had become, and she felt ashamed of herself. She tried to convince herself that she didn't care what others thought, but it didn't convince her. To cheer herself up, she went back to thinking about what she and Darren could do with the money. I'd really like to see Paris, she thought. I've always heard it's very beautiful there. She pictured herself walking by the Eiffel Tower, shopping in exclusive French salons and dining in fine restaurants. Those thoughts lifted her spirits, and she was almost there when Darren returned. He entered the motel room carrying a large briefcase. Okay, he said. I think we've got it all sorted out. He patted the briefcase. There's 80 Gs inside this briefcase. You need to guard it until it's locked in the vault, because if anything happens to it, the Russians will pounce on us like a shark on a seal. Shannon shuddered at that picture, then asked, So how is all this going to work? It's probably best if you don't know, Darren replied. That way you can't accidentally give anything away. Shannon didn't like his distrust of her, but before she could say anything, he hurried to continue. There's one more action you need to take to seal the deal, and then we will be free. She listened to his instructions and smiled weakly. I can handle it, she said confidently. Shortly before five o'clock that evening, Darren dropped Shannon off outside the Foundation's office. Just remember, baby, in an hour we're going to be rich, he said encouragingly. Shannon started walking towards the building, carrying her briefcase in her hands. Darren had handled it so far, and she was surprised to find how much all those stacks of hundred-dollar bills weighed. Sesterman was waiting anxiously for her. When he tried to take the briefcase from her, she snatched it back. Easy, easy, he soothed. I'll just count it. He pointed to a metal briefcase on a table nearby. The Eurobonds are in there. You can check them out if you want. Shannon walked over to Sesterman's briefcase and quickly counted the face value of the bonds. She then pulled one of the bonds from the middle of the stack and took a picture of it on her cell phone. She then emailed the photo to the account she had designated. A few minutes later, her phone rang, and a voice with a Slavic accent said, They are real. You may proceed. She gave a silent sigh of relief and nodded to Sesterman. All right, he said. Let's get started. They each picked up their briefcases and walked out to Sesterman's Mercedes. He drove in silence for several miles until they pulled up to a somewhat run-down self-service warehouse. Shannon's doubts must have reflected on her face because Sesterman said, I chose this place because no one ever comes here. We won't be disturbed. Sesterman pulled up in front of one of the roll-up doors, and they both got out of the car. When he unlocked the padlock and lifted the door, Shannon saw that there was nothing inside except a rack along one wall. Sesterman slid his briefcase onto the shelf and suggested she do the same with hers. The money will be safe here until we get back from the container terminal, he told her. They exited the vault, and Sesterman clicked his lock. 
Shannon then attached the padlock she had brought with her in her purse. Now neither of us can get in without the other, she told him. He nodded reluctantly. Okay, she said when they got back in the car. Let's go look at a lot of iPads. Sesterman drove east and turned onto the Lincoln Highway, heading south. When he reached Port Street, he drove around it in a circle, heading east, and then turned south on Corbin Street and entered the Port Newark Container Terminal. The place was huge, and Shannon had to pull out the manual Darren had given her to explain to Sesterman where to find what they were looking for. They drove slowly past row after row of brightly colored shipping containers. Loading cranes loomed in the background like giant orange birds. Eventually, they turned onto a narrow street of colorful containers, and Shannon directed Sesterman to stop beside one painted bright blue. She checked the numbers on the end of the container against a sheet from her purse, then looked at Sesterman. Here it is, she told him. She handed him the key, and he quickly unlocked the padlock and opened one of the two doors. The 40-foot-long container was filled with large boxes with the familiar Apple logo. Sesterman pulled a folding knife from his pocket and quickly opened one of the boxes, revealing a stack of smaller boxes inside. He opened one of them and pulled out an iPad, letting out a gleeful exclamation. I told you so, Shannon said. Then, as Darren did, she added, But you should check the boxes in the back to make sure they're all the same. You're right, Sesterman agreed eagerly and began climbing over the large boxes to get to the far end of the container. When he almost reached the back wall, Shannon couldn't wait any longer and began trying to close the container door. Hearing the hinges creak, Sesterman turned and yelled, What the hell are you doing? Furious, he began backing toward the entrance while Shannon desperately tried to close the door. But the locking post was stuck, and she didn't have the strength to move it. As Sesterman approached, she turned in fear and ran back down the alley of shipping containers until she was on the street. Screaming with rage, Sesterman climbed out of the container and rushed after her, but saw her jump into Darren's waiting car. He quickly turned around and ran back to his Mercedes to pursue them. But no sooner had he pulled out of the alley than an 18-wheeler truck braked at the entrance to the alley, blocking the way. In a rage, Sesterman jumped out of the car and demanded that the driver move over, but he responded in a language Sesterman did not understand. Then the driver and his assistant began unloading their truck, while Sesterman stood there cursing in frustration. And Shannon was still shaking as she and Darren pulled out of the container terminal and headed toward the storage warehouse. I felt like I was running on tar, she gasped. I was sure he'd catch me. Darren only grinned. You don't have to worry about Sesterman, he grinned. Those truckers have orders to keep him there for an hour before they remove their vehicle. We'll be long gone by then. Won't he call the police? she asked anxiously. Send and send them to the vault to find all that cash and euro bonds? Unlikely. That would surely be the end of his political dreams. Darren laughed. When they pulled up to the warehouse, it was deserted. Shannon quickly ran to the door of the Sesterman's room and used the key to unlock it. While she did so, Darren opened the trunk of his car and pulled out a pair of bolt cutters. It took some fumbling, but the shackle wouldn't budge under the heavy-duty wire cutters. Quickly grabbing the handle, Darren lifted the door. That's it, he said gleefully and ducked inside. Shannon followed him and watched Darren frantically fumble around the insides of the small container. Then he turned around, grabbed Shannon by the shoulders, and started shaking her. Where are the briefcases? he shouted. Where's the money? Shannon twisted out of his grip and walked over to the bare shelving unit to look. We left them right here she said in confusion. I know they were here. Sesterman must have taken them, exclaimed Darren, trying to find some explanation. No, he didn't, Shannon shrilled. I saw them with my own eyes. They were on the shelf when we locked the door. Darren grabbed his head and groaned. When he looked up at her, she saw that his face had gone pale. Oh God, oh God, he groaned. This is bad. This is very bad. The Russians will kill us if we don't bring them the money. His fear caused Shannon to panic. It's not our fault, Darren, she cried out desperately. Someone must have stolen it. The Russians will understand. They must understand. You don't understand, 
These are very bad people. I know what they did to people who owed them, and we owe them a whole lot of money. We're as bad as dead men. No, Shannon shouted, grabbing Darren's arm. We can talk to them. We can pull another scam and then pay them off. Let go of me, you stupid bitch, yelled Darren, pushing her with such force that she fell to the concrete floor, bruising her hip. I have to get out of here. While she stared at him in shock, he jumped out of the warehouse and headed for his car. Wait for me, she shouted, trying to get to her feet, but Darren ignored her and started the engine. But no sooner had he put the car in motion than two large black SUVs pulled into the driveway, completely blocking his path. Several large men ran up to the car door and yanked Darren out of the driver's seat. In seconds, they had his hands tied and had him in the back seat of one of the SUVs. As she stood there, paralyzed by the sight, Shannon felt rough hands grab her arms and twist them behind her back. Heavy plastic bands tightened around her wrists, and then she was dragged toward the opposite door of the same SUV Darren was in. Once inside, another plastic strap was wrapped around her ankles, and she found herself completely helpless. Terrified, she looked at Darren and saw one of the men pulling a burlap sack over his head. Then her eyes darkened as she felt the rough cloth clinging to her face. She began to plead with her captors, but a rough voice ordered her to be silent, and she obeyed out of fear. As the car picked up speed, Shannon suddenly remembered Robert's account of the mob execution he had investigated the night she met Darren. Hot, stinging tears streamed down her cheeks, mucus running down her upper lip and into her mouth. She had to gasp for breath, which only made her cry harder. Her panic-stricken mind desperately searched for some miracle that could save her. Maybe someone will see us like this and report us to the police, she thought, but immediately remembered the tinted windows and wallowed in self-pity. It's not fair, she thought. I'm not a bad person. I don't deserve to die. But when she thought about the way she had treated Robert and his family, she had to admit that she wasn't a very good person after all. In her feverish state, even the figure of the old man they had deceived in Wilmington came back to accuse her. Her thoughts drifted back to her family, and she tried to recall the religion her father had tried in vain to instill in her. She mentally began to bargain with God, promising to change her life, to become a better person, if only he would spare her. But no matter how hard she tried, she could not remember a single prayer, and finally she sank down on the seat in utter despair. A sound came from her side, and she realized Darren was whimpering. And here I thought he was a bad boy, she thought angrily. At that moment, the car swerved around a corner, causing her to flip over in her seat, and the pain in her bruised hip reminded her of Darren's cowardly attempt to escape without her. She silently began cursing him and herself for getting carried away with him. The car took a sharp turn, and it was clear from the vibration of the tires that they had turned onto a dirt road. Shannon was seized with a new attack of terror. We're in a junkyard, she thought, and started sobbing again. The SUV braked sharply, nearly slamming Shannon into the seat in front of her. The door beside her swung open, and she cried out as she felt hands groping her legs. Don't move, a voice commanded roughly, and immediately the plastic tape around her ankles came off. Now she was grabbed by the arm and dragged out of the car. The unknown captor led her forward, and she heard Darren shuffling beside her. Stumbling, they walked on the uneven ground for about 20 yards and then stopped. Strong arms wrapped around her shoulders and forced her to her knees. The ground was rocky, but in her fear, Shannon hardly noticed it. A voice on one side of them asked, How much longer? Five minutes tops, another voice replied. At first, Shannon was puzzled, but the horrible truth quickly came to her. She had less than five minutes to live. She started to lower herself to the ground, but someone's hand roughly pulled her back up. And then, as she was kneeling and trembling with terror, footsteps were heard behind her, and suddenly, a light shone through the loose weave of the burlap. It must be the headlights of a car, she thought, and then shrieked as she felt a hand on the back of her head. In the same instant, the bag was pulled off her head, and in the blinding light, she saw only a pair of feet standing in front of her. Is this what you wanted? 
a bitter voice rang out, and Shannon shuddered. That sounds like Robert's voice, she thought incredulously. Did you really want that kind of life, living like a common criminal, constantly on the run, with a man like him? The voice asked again. Now Shannon knew she was right. Robert's voice had lowered but was full of emotion. I would give you everything, Shannon. I would do anything to make you happy. I'd take a bullet for you. There was nothing she could do but hunched over in shame and misery. Here, he said sharply, and as she looked up, she saw him reach for the inside pocket of his jacket. She flinched involuntarily, but instead of the gun she feared, he pulled out an envelope and tossed it to the ground in front of her. Since you wanted it so badly, here are your divorce papers, he said bitterly. He stared at her for a moment, then looked up and looked around at the others. I've had enough. You can have them both, he said, and stepped away from the kneeling couple. No, One of the other figures standing outside the circle of light spoke up. All right, folks, the show is over. Let's get back to work. Shannon and Darren were lifted to their feet. With their hands bound, they were led over to the SUV and placed in the back seat. Someone tossed an envelope into Shannon's lap. A few minutes later, they were on the highway heading southeast. Darren was the first to come to his senses and demanded in an angry voice, What the hell was that? The figure in the passenger seat turned around, and Shannon was surprised to see that it was an attractive African-American woman. It was a small professional courtesy we extended to a fellow FBI agent who wanted a chance to meet his ex-wife, she said. We decided to add some theatricality. FBI, Darren grinned. I should have known. How long have you been after us? The agent laughed. Hell, you two are just little fish in a big pond. We weren't even hunting you. We were just using you as bait to catch the real bad guys, the Russian mafia. We busted them all this afternoon. Understanding appeared in his eyes, and Darren threw her angrily. You're the one who took the money from the locker. The woman only grinned. Of course we took them. Evidence, you know? Darren looked at her hatefully. You bloody bastards, he cursed. You stupid asshole, you should be thanking us, snapped at the agent. If we hadn't arrested them, your Russian friends were planning to take you both out as soon as you got the money out of the locker. We've had you and them under surveillance for a long time. We heard them planning it. Shannon sighed, and Darren's bravado evaporated. After a while, Shannon meekly asked, Where are we going now? The agent looked at her for the first time. To the Essex County Jail, of course, she said. What did you expect? She finally adopted a puzzled look on her face and turned to Shannon. Why the hell did you leave Robert Cunningham for that little piece of shit? Shannon couldn't look her in the eye. I guess I've always liked bad boys. What bad boys? The agent asked contemptuously. You mean that little coward with the wet pants where he peed his pants? The agent driving the car whined. He peed his pants? Damn, I'm going to have to clean the back seat again. The female agent laughed, then turned to Shannon again. Did you need a bad boy? She asked contemptuously. You were married to one of the toughest FBI agents on the East Coast. This man already has more awards for bravery than most agents hope to receive in their entire career. Your ex-husband caught mob bosses, bank robbers, and serial killers, and you wanted a bad boy? I never knew, Shannon said in a thin voice. Yes, you didn't know, the woman said stiffly. And you almost killed him. Many of us thought he wouldn't survive after you ran away from him. That man loved you so much, and you treated him like a piece of street trash. She took a deep breath to calm herself. But after tonight, I think he'll be fine. And when he's back on the market, there'll be plenty of single ladies in the bureau who'll be after him. And guess what? I may turn out to be one of them. The agent behind the wheel snorted derisively. Damn, Alice, and I thought I liked you. The woman laughed and playfully patted him on the shoulder. Shut up, Ray. You know your wife would skin you alive if she heard you talk like that. Before she could say anything else, the driver announced, We're here. 
and made a sharp turn into the emergency room of the blue-painted Essex County Correctional Facility Complex. Shannon and Darren were escorted into the building and led down a hallway. As they walked down the fluorescent-lit hallway, a female agent took Shannon's hand and pulled her to the right, away from Darren. They came to an empty cell, and after guiding Shannon inside, the agent slammed the door shut and left. Shannon sank down on the bunk chained to the wall and tried to comprehend everything that had happened to her. The events she had experienced, from the adrenaline rush caused by the Sesterman bite to the terror of imminent death, from the rush of relief when she realized she would stay alive to the shame of confronting Robert, had driven her to emotional exhaustion. And it, remembering how Darren had abandoned her while trying to save himself, she felt the joy of being separated from him. Even if he hadn't tried to abandon me, she thought, his Russian friends would have killed us. How could I ever have been tempted to run away with a man like him? She reproached herself. Then she remembered what the female FBI agent had told her about Robert. Obviously, this woman had a very different opinion of the man she had married. She thinks he's a hero, Shannon marveled. A rumbling sound from somewhere in the building made her look up, and the sight of the barred door reminded her of the future that awaited her. The thought of spending years of her life in prison was deeply depressing, and worst of all, she had no one to blame but herself. Suddenly, the female agent reappeared behind the bars. She unlocked the cell door and beckoned to Shannon. Come on, she said, and led Shannon down a hallway that ended in a door. When she opened it, the cool night air hit Shannon in the face. They were in the parking lot, where a car with the engine running was waiting for them. Shannon looked back at the agent in confusion. What's going on? But the agent simply directed her toward the waiting car. Then the door opened, and a familiar figure stepped out of the car. Daddy? She cried out in bewilderment, and when she saw that it was indeed her father, she rushed to him and hugged him, sobbing into his lapels. I'm so sorry, Daddy. I'm so sorry for everything, she sobbed. Come on, honey, he said in a voice choked with emotion, and she let him lead her to the passenger side of his car. Where are we going? she asked. We're going home, honey, he replied softly. But I don't understand, she said pitifully. Why am I free? How did you guess to take me here? As her father pulled onto Doremus Avenue and headed for the New Jersey turnoff, he glanced at his prodigal daughter. I got a call from Robert, he said. He asked me to give you a message. He said, tell her it's a parting gift from SpongeBob. Shannon let out a small cry of pain and burst into tears again. She couldn't decide if her unexpected and completely undeserved redemption was an act of kindness on Robert's part or the harshest punishment he could give her. The End Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, so subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.